Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope that you all had a wonderful summer full of fun times with your family and friends. My name is Sabrina Teldon, and I'll be a chief resident this year. And today it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Kisar Arias. He is the Margaret and Herbert DuPont Chair in Infectious Diseases and holds the Laurel and Robert H. Grant Faculty Fellowship at the Govern Medical School in Houston, Texas. He is the director and founder of the Center of Antimicrobial Resistance and Microbial Genomics at the Govern Medical School and the Center for Infectious Diseases at the University of Texas Health School of Public Health. He received his medical degree at El Bosque, Bogota. He obtained his master's in clinical microbiology at the University of London and his PhD in microbial biochemistry and molecular microbiology at the University of Cambridge. He completed his internal medicine and infectious disease training at the University of Texas, Health McGovern Medical School, and MD Anderson Cancer Center. He joined the UT Health faculty as assistant professor in 2008 and became professor in 2016. He was previously awarded a Wellcome Trust International Fellowship to develop antimicrobial resistance research in Columbia, where he founded and still directs the Molecular Genetics and Antimicrobial Resistance Unit and International Center for Microbial Genomics. He is a nationally and internationally recognized expert conducting NIH-funded basic translational and clinical research on mechanisms of antibiotic resistance with emphasis on gram-positive organisms. He's the author of more than 150 publications in high impact journals and is a prominent speaker at both national and international scientific conferences in his field. We look forward to his presentation here today on BRE, a precision medicine approach. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Chukla, for uh, the invitation. To really be here and see this amazing place. I haven't had the opportunity to see uh, this complex. It's very impressive. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about um, something very specific in infectious diseases, but I hope to apply to internal medicine because I understand this is a broad audience. Um, the, uh, I have some disclosures uh, of, of, of brands. So, this is what uh, is the agenda for today. I'm going to discuss the concept of precision medicine in infectious diseases. I know this is a very hot concept in medicine in general, particularly cancer, chemotherapy, and other diseases. But how do we apply this in infectious diseases? And I'm going to use nitric oxide, and, and I explain why, as, as, uh, as to develop this concept of a hospital-associated package. Let's show you some data where we got recently to understand all these concepts. And then I'm going to talk the relationship with things that we are developing, particularly with the microbiome. And then I'm going to finish to try to give you what the therapeutic and susceptibility test dilemmas when you treat an infectious disease, when you really don't know, don't have options to treat a patient. So let's start with this concept, and this is uh, what is precision medicine. It's a very hard topic, and if you're a new resident, that's what you're going to hear for the rest of your career. So that means it's an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, lifestyle for each individual. So the whole idea is that you as a person, you can customize your treatment, your therapeutic of, uh, approach, and you as a physician can understand that to give you a specific treatment for your particular condition. So that holds sort of directed or goal-oriented to the host. This is so important right now that the NIH has put a, a millions of dollars to revolutionary medicine with this approach. There's an initial $215 million investment for this, and the idea is to pioneer treatments and provide clinicians with new tools, mostly divided or derived from genomic understanding of disease, to basically put up uh, and, and increase the strength of knowledge, therapy, and treatment to treat your patients the best you can. And this is, as you know, being applied for chronic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, but probably the most amazing or most obvious application is in oncology. So you have a tumor right now, you sequence your tumor, you decide therapy based on mutation specifically for your tumor, and based on that, you would establish not only diagnostic tests, but also therapeutic approaches. So, 
And this is a disease. Cardiovascular disease this is some approach that is being tried to do. But what happens in infectious diseases? Apart from the host in infectious diseases, so you have many other factors, and one of the other important factors is the pathogen. A pathogen that usually is well adapted within a host. So when it starts to count what happens with the infection, the pathogen, the host, is the balance between these two responses that eventually gives you the clinical presentation. That is the symptoms and the symptom of an infection. So you have basically two organisms colliding. And if you understand the genetics of one organism, you may may think to have the, the understand what the other organism is doing. And remember, organisms were in the face of this earth before human actually walked here, billions of years. So the adaptability of these organisms is much, much more uh, evident and, and flexible than we humans are. In infectious diseases, in medicine, everybody, if you are an internet, you have to have used an antibiotic. If you didn't use an antibiotic, you didn't go to residency, I'm sure. Right? So if you look at the amount of patients that hospitalized, that hospitalized in a given moment, at least 30 to 60% are on an antibiotic. Whether that antibiotic is widely prescribed or not is questionable. But everybody, unlike oncology drugs, cardiovascular drugs, is able to prescribe antibiotics. Even if you have no idea about what antibiotic does or what the mechanism action, you can actually prescribe it. Second, the antibiotic has to be cheap. Nobody thinks about a, uh, 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 an antibiotic that is expensive, right? But if you have a hefty drug, for example, or an oncology drug, that drug oh, is okay that it's expensive. Even though an antibiotic saves your life, an oncology drug, and I'm, I'm not bashing on the oncologist, an oncology drug may prolong your life for three weeks, then there is a different perception of what an antibiotic should do or versus another drug. If you think about none of the interventions that we're doing currently in medicine, oncology therapy, transplant medicine, surgery could be done without antibiotics. And even though that's life-saving drugs, they're always being there. Right? They're always being there and they're being cheap. You know? Even though pharmaceutical companies would build on that, now when we are facing this crisis of the microbial resistance is when we're starting to pay attention. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And that's why, why because we do this. These antimicrobials are supposed to tip the balance between disease and death, basically. So if you use antibiotics, you can tip the balance. And in general, the only way that we have in infectious diseases to prescribe antibiotics is to determine in a very artificial test that was developed almost 200 years ago if the organism is susceptible to the antibiotic or resistant. And we assume that that antibiotic, if it's susceptible, we are going to have success in therapy. If it's resistant, most likely it's going to fail, so we can use it. And I'm going to try to debunk this concept for the rest of my talk. And I apologize to the microbiologists in the audience if, if, if you know, this is something that they don't like. So, um, I bring enterococci as an example um, because it's an uh, organism that has evolved with us. And I have, I'll give some examples later. This is the copy of a paper that was published, look at the date, 1899. So if you ever want to read uh, the most beautiful description of, of a disease and how it was treated and see the pathological evolution of a disease, read that paper. There was a, there was a patient that was infected with endocarditis at that, uh, at that time with an organism called Micrococcus simogenus, and now it's Enterococcus fecalis. And it was September 14, 1899, in Dr. Osler's service, right? And so you as a new resident, you know, Osler should excite you all the time at the hospital hospital. Fever for three months, contra headache, have a diastolic murmur, and of course, has in the they have echo, right? So the only thing that they could do is just look what happened with the patient. After three months, the patient died, 
they did an autopsy at that time. They showed, but actually these words, they took the organism and they put the organism in an animal. It was one of the first examples, pathological reproduction, of using an animal as a, as a, as a model of disease, and they could reproduce this endocarditis. The paper is about 28 pages long, right? But it's more reading if you are a doctor. So, so that's 1899. Remember, we don't have antibiotics here. We don't have anything to do about this. Then in 2011, Houston, Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center, patient neutropenic uh, with a lymphoma who, who is bacteremic with this organism called vancomycin resistant enterococci for four months, right? No blood cultures are negative at any point uh, except for a, for a couple. And the patient ends up uh, dying, actually dies because after all these antibiotics, became uh, infected with a candida giller monday and then still a tropomonic mycophilia in the lung and then died from multiple infections. Despite the availability, and MD Anderson, you can get whatever you want, you know, and um, so all these antibiotics, the patient end, ended up dying. But most importantly, the organism that was isolated and based in a blood work, it, it started with an MIT of three that means susceptible. So we did an experiment in vivo the organism for dactomycin ended up in an MIC of 256, but for linesomate from 1.5 ended up in an MIC of 64. That means that from susceptible, we were able to select a very nicely resistant organism in a patient when we do in vitro in the lab because we are blasting this patient with antibiotics and this bug is adapting and adapting and to the point that we didn't have anything to treat this patient. The patient that they died the culture was positive for the year. Okay. So, 1899 to 2011, you know, the same outcome, you know. And we have, uh, you know, we're going to Mars, right, eventually. So we have the technologies, the intelligence, and we still struggle to do this. So one of, one of the reasons is that bacteria are not stupid first, right? And this is the best example to show you this. So this is from another patient, a bacterial patient, with an enterococci as well. This is a petri dish. This is the old petri dish um, that you, you, you go, and Dr. Martinez knows this very well. So you put some discs there, and you're supposed to be a halo of inhibition, and that in, in, in means the antibiotic is active or not. As you can see in this plate, you see this is a disc of vancomycin, and this is a halo, means bacteria that is actually growing only around the disc of vancomycin. So they don't grow anywhere else but around vancomycin. So this organism became addicted to vancomycin. So it's a vancomycin dependent enterococci. So that's the maximum threshold for resistance. Not only became resistant, but became dependent. Does anyone can guess how? The patient was treated. Yes, vancomycin was stopped. And the patient cleared the bacteremia. Two days later, reverted with a new mutation and then became not dependent again. Right? So this is what we do every time we give an antibiotic. And I'll tell you where is the reservoir of this in, in, in important ways. This organ is in particular in trochopsi. It's a very recent paper from uh, uh, Michael Gilmore at Harvard showing that this organism has evolved with us. And when I say with us, you could potentially find enterococci in dinosaurs and even in species before, you know, was uh, uh, life on Earth after the, they left the oceans. And there was a big evolutionary changes here that eventually that, uh, gave us the two more common species Enterococcus species and Enterococcus fecalis. So organisms like these and many others that now live with us um, to the point that the United Nations has uh, declared antiviral system as one of the top health priorities in the world is what we are seeing in our hospitals. So genomics now, as I as it started revolutionary uh, um, cancer and other things I said, it's starting to help us to understand how this organism evolved. So this is a study 
using genomics and to understand where these organisms came from that are actually infected this. I told you this organism comes maybe from dinosaurs and have evolved. And they could show that there are two organisms, two uh, genetic lineages of this enterococcus tissue that are clearly discernible by genomic markers. One called clay B, that is the nice organism that usually we see in our gut. In fact, in Europe, you still find probiotics with enterococcus tissue. The other is the clinical lineage that is interspersed with animal, animal isolates that are usually come to humans through sharing of things sharing with animals, and we do that all the time. This separation appeared about 3,000 3, years ago, when actually humans started to domesticate animals. And the second biggest split seemed to have happened when antibiotics were introduced in the market. So for enterococci, this is a very small time for evolution, like in any bacteria. So they are pretty adapted to cause uh, problems in humans. Recent uh, um, um, uh, studies from my lab, this is uh, phylogenetic, a little bit more sophisticated uh, uh, graph, it shows the same. If you are not used to that, this is a phylogenetic analysis of bacterial genomes, about 303 bacterial genomes. This is like a clock, I mean, this is the center. If you move clockwise, that means that it's more uh, uh, away from the center, it's less related to a founder on this. So if you can see here in this color, these are animal isolates that you see very various. So there are a lot of separations in this tree. But if you see the clinical isolates here in red and in green, there are two clear clades that are independently seem to be causing uh, disease around the world and associated with infections. So we have acquired a particular genetic lineage that is not the enterococcus tissue that you have or, or the other person have, but they belong to a same plate, but somehow they have adapted to this host. So that opens the possibilities. What are the changes specifically that are happens to this? So this is the organism as an example of what we're doing with precision medicine. So we do it with the human genome, we pay the same attention with the bacterial genome. Right? So let's now do, uh, uh, show some clinical data of what this organism produces. Believe it or not, for this organism, prospective data are really scarce. So we're trying to produce this. This is a study that is led by an uh, internal medicine resident, uh, Dr. Herman Contreras, and he's a faculty in, in Chile, Dr. Jose Monita. It's called the Venus One, under the umbrella initially of the Antimicrobial Resistant Leadership Group. It's called Vancomycin Resistant and Trogoxide Outcome Study. Dr. Monita said Venus, and I thought that was a cool name, and his name meant uh, Venus. It's a prospective observational study of enterococcal infection. There are not too many sometimes, except in Miami, I guess. All those team isolates now. We're collecting now in three centers and expanding to uh, another in the country. So I'm just going to show you some clinical data on this. So this is the first 282 patients. Uh, basically uh, from uh, Houston and Detroit. 69 of them are VRE, 2013 are VSC, vancomycin susceptible. So to make this story short, because I don't have time, I'm showing the multivariate analysis. But what are the factors that influence the mortality of these patients? ICO admission, ah, right, you know, so you are sick there. Neutropenia, feedback during a score, as you know, is a score of severity. So more than three, you have 7.27 odd ratio of, of, of dying. Hemodialysis, and this is if you do for any organisms, these factors are going to come up. And in this case, having DRE in the blood increases with odd ratio mortality with this relatively small sample, higher than being admitted to the ICU. And as our patient in Anderson, as I show, you are not able to eradicate the organism from the blood your all ratio is almost four. That means you fail therapy, you have 300% more chances of dying. Right? So, your system that is directly related to that. And you can construct a couple of mayor curve on this and say, I mean, red here, for example, this is the probability of surviving. You say the DRE in, 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 in red 
there in a noisy area, and you see the separation even from the beginning that is statistically significant. So having a multi-drug resistant organism kills people. You know, I know this seems obvious, but it is not that obvious. And if we don't have antibiotics, people will die. So the next level is, okay, we know that, now we know the organism, so where are they coming from? So where are these organisms coming from? So in the initial part of the epidemic, most of these organisms came from us, the doctors, coming from patient to patient. And Dr. Abo is very strict to do this, and they will tell you that that will not happen here, right? So, and if we do the normal epidemiology of infection control, we, we may be able to actually stop an outbreak, but we notice that these organisms keep popping up in all these patients. Why is that? Because we carry them. The patients carry them. And where do they carry them? In the most impressive reservoir of bacteria in the world, which is the microbiome, our gut, right? So we probably have more bacterial cells that the human cells are the best available now. So our, the bacterial DNA is part of our DNA. And the interaction of these microorganisms there are very crucial. So what happens, for example, in the gut? We usually have very nice bacteria in the absence of antibiotics. It protects us. They have evolved with us. They actually influence if you are thin, if you are obese. We are learning many things that the microbiome is actually doing to us, right? So you go to the hospital or somebody gives you an antibiotic, and the, the, the immune system actually detects a healthy microbiome and says there's no need to produce uh, 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 any molecules or, or certain cells say, let's produce certain molecules to, to, to keep uh, bad bacteria at bay. This is, for example, a molecule called Rex3 gamma. In, this is in mice, um, but in humans, big data, so not in a peptides that have organisms at bay. We give antibiotics, particularly the most famous combination, the trioxone, vancomycin, and methanidazole to every patient that goes to the ER at least in my hospital, right? So we wipe out our good guys, right? And organisms like anthrotoxia, I'm telling you, very strong organisms, you know, have the possibility to expand. And not only that, the immune system recognizes this as a, there is no need because there is no bacteria coming to bacteria to produce antimicrobial molecules. They shut down the production, and this is the perfect need for antibiotics, so for uh, antibiotic antimicrobial resistant organisms to do. And this has clinical significance. For example, this is data coming from uh, Eric Palmer in, in his own catering. Here you have five patients with, uh, with more mild transplant in which they actually do microbiome every week. So they, this is going to be very simple to explain. If you have a lot of colors, means there is a lot of variety in your microbiome, that means your microbiome is healthier. But if you have one single color dominating your gut, that means the diversity is gone and you are in bad shape. So look at this patient A and patient B. In day 67 after the bone marrow transplant, all the microbiome is green, and that green happens to be the urine. Patient B, in day plus one of transplant, all the microbiome is dominated by the urine, and they sure have blood stream infection that you cannot really control despite antibiotics. Okay? Look at patients C, D, and E. There is a lot of more color, and these patients do not develop a, uh, a bacteria like this. So this has opened the possibilities to do actually prevention of stewardship of the microbiome when you understand this thing. Epidemic has shown clearly that if your diversity decreases, the possibility of dying increases almost exponentially. So the more we give antibiotics and we destroy our microbiome, that always happens. And also, this is in bone marrow transplant, this is the possibility that the dual DRE or proteobacteria becomes dominating in your gut, increases with date post transplant as we put more and more antibiotics. 
So, and he actually pointed out that using metronidazole was an important effect and you de- basically delete or destroy all your nice anaerobic gut. So, the organisms that actually produce the good things are wiped out with this. And in a polyvary bacteria, you have almost 9.3 partial ratio to have bacteria in your gut is dominated by this. So, okay, so is there, just at the moment, nothing we can do. But the only way to treat a sexual disease is to use antibiotics. So, the next step, okay, how are we going to treat this? So, funny enough, there is only one drug approved now for the treatment of antimicin resistant antibiotics, is linesolid. And linesolid is a drug that we've had for many years, it's a bacteriostatic agent, and in general, I want to show you. You don't want bacteriostatic bacteri- 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 agents with this uh, bug if you really want to kill it. So these are more approved drugs that one way or another we have used in all these years. One is kinopressin and alfopressin that I don't know if you guys have still here, but not in Houston anymore. That drug, you put it in a vein, it is side, side effects, a lot of problems, really not available. But a clinical, it's not available in the United States anymore, as far as I know. But I know some people in South America use it still. Nitrofurantoin is only used for the United tract infection. Phosphomycin IV, not available in, in the United States, available in Europe, and alone is not bad. So you end up with these four antibiotics. Oritavancin and Tedisolate. Tedisolate is a casting of, of linesolate, and the role in this infection is still questionable. Or it's a fancy, it's a new glyph of lycopeptide with a half life of a week. Nobody understands, although I've used it out of desperation for this. Uh, nobody no, no, knows how to use it. Pygocycline is a drug that is bacteriostatic. Uh, can, we can use in bacteremia because the blood levels are low. So eventually you get the dab with that drug that has, was well, approved about 15 years ago for the bacteremia. It's a drug that was resurrected from the 80s, and uh, despite of that, we don't know how to use it, we don't know what dose to use, and it's still it's a drug that is the only one that potentially has bacterial activity against this. So, linesolate and daptomycin are now the two drugs that people are trying to use. As I mentioned to you, data on these are scars, and this is one of the largest retrospective data from the VA hospital so I'm trying to compare this to linesolid versus uh, daptomycin. They actually showed that if you use linesolid against BRE, you die more. So showing that there is a hint that daptomycin is likely to be much much better drug than linesolid. And they could show clearly the difference between linesolid and daptomycin with daptomycin and bacteria drug probably being uh, um, with better outcomes than linesolid. The caveat here is, is, is data that is uh, uh, retrospective. The same group also analyzed, you start with the mesolate and test to optimizing, actually patients die more, particularly those that are sick, and that was statistically significant. Okay? So that has pushed a lot of people of using this drug called daptomycin, which is an antibiotic that was initially discovered in the 80s, it's a natural product, uh, was directed in, in the 2000s for treating a drug resistant infection. So now we have this drug that there's some data that, we, that suggests we can use it. Now, how can we use it? So we ask the lab if this organism is susceptible to this drug or not. And that has become a very difficult question to answer. So, for people who are starting residency and or more than in, 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 in infectious diseases, this is what an MIC is, minimal inhibitory concentration. So, you take a bar, you grow it, and then you are, uh, add antibiotic in dilutions of two, and then eventually, when you don't see by your own eye, growth is what you call it MIC. And that's what we use to treat patients, right? That's what we call to use this is susceptible. There's now a much sophisticated term called E-test in which the antibiotic diffuses and you see a halo and inhibition. And when there is an intersection, that's what we call the MIC. You see carefully, there are 
some colonies growing up here that are not really at that time, right? At that cutoff. So this is what an MIC is. So if you translate this into troponins, you know, troponins with all those, you say you have a heart attack, or certain genetic tests, you have a very accurate test. This is the test developed by Pasteur that we use in the 21st century at the moment. So that doesn't take into account if the organism is in the blood, in the CSF, how we're going to use it, but that's the tool that we use to treat a patient. And we ask the lab, is it susceptible or resistant? Okay? So if it's susceptible again, you say success, or resistant is failure, and I'll show you how that's not true. Uh, maybe the best example of this has been vancomycin. Like everybody has used vancomycin once in their life against the staphorus. In fact, the breakpoint point, which they call you susceptible or resistant, is two. But certain data clearly show that if you have an MIC of two, that you call it susceptible, that it could be debatable. Maybe half of your patients will do that. And that's a really bad test, right? Even, even if you have an MIC of 2, about 30% of your patients will do bad. So in any other specialty, that will be a really crappy test, right? And you will not want to do it. Another issue, going back to the statement, bacteria are not stupid. If you take a colony, a simple colony of bacteria, the one there are 10 to the 8 cells, and you try to test how many bacteria survive to ascending concentration of the antibiotic. You can see the majority, as you increase the dose of the antibiotic, some bacteria die, but there are others that survive, a much lower inoculum. So imagine this bacteria and a vegetation on the top of a hard valve. The start of antibiotics, you may destroy some of them, but the others that have a little change in the MIC are going to survive and are going to give you recurrent infection and eventually failure for this. Right? So, and there is no way that we can test that in the laboratory. Not even with an army of technicians, we can really do that reliable in the time frame that is going to be there. Okay? So, initially, at least in the United States, there is an entity that tells you that from my thing, breakpoints to call it susceptible is this. And below this is susceptible, above that is resistant, and this is what they do. They chose a four. So one of my fellows in the lab took a patient that had a susceptible bacteria, received the antibiotic, in this case that promising, and then we isolated a resistant organism. And then we whole genome sequence both the susceptible and the resistant, and we found what the alleles had changed. So he took one of these alleles and put it in the susceptible background. So in this case, I'm doing a killing curve. So what am I doing here? I take bacteria and then give antibiotics at 10 times above that cutoff of MIC and see if I can kill it. So if I can kill it, this is the blue dotted line. That means from my initial inoculum, I get 24 hours and killing a lot of bacteria. That's how the susceptible organism should be, and that correlates with the antibiotic being effective. The resistant bacteria has a higher MIC in red, which is without antibiotic, as you can see in red, in the dotted line, you don't do anything. But the MIC is high, so you expect it is not going to work. Look at the red dotted line. This is the susceptible organism in which you don't introduce a single mutation in one particular gene, and this, the MIC did not change, it was almost the same as the susceptible, but you cannot kill it. And you, is like the same behavior as a resistant organism. And with that, you can detect it. And with this test that I show you, you cannot detect it. So, this is a breakpoint, and this is a bunch of bacteria organization, for example, the breakpoint is here. You had a lot of bacteria potentially with the MIC there. So with that promising in particular, this is not only a problem, but you can even do a right test. 
which is in a paper we just published recently with Dr. Dr. Rodney Humphreys. This is three of the best microbiology labs in the United States doing MIC. Each line represents the number of isolates and the MICs where they actually uh, reported it. As you see, there is a huge variation in the testing of this between labs. So that means this test eventually for this drug is completely useless. Okay? And this has clinical implications. Actually, when Dr. Shukla was in Houston, he uh, published a paper in which we took all these susceptible organisms and show if there is any difference when the MIC is very low, when the MIC is high. And indeed, he showed that when the MIC is high, even the proper susceptible, we had an odd ratio of 4.7 of not being successful. And that means not eradicating the organism from the blood. So, um, so that, that work actually led for uh, this year for the CLSI eventually changing the breakpoint. And this is a discussion we can have later. But that, those conservation have enormous clinical implications. So, I told you this is precision medicine. So in order to understand this, my, the idea is that now I'm going to tell you that we can now do better than this test. And doing better is understanding the mechanisms and the genomics of these organisms and try to eventually get rid of these MICs. So this is capomycin, and I'm going to concentrate because that I've been talking to you about this drug. This is an antimicrobial peptide and it is causing to be active is very similar to the antimicrobial peptide that we use. The mechanism of action is still debatable you know, after all these years. And it appears that this drug binds to the membrane of bacteria, oligomerizes in the outer beneath of the membrane, and then translocates. When it does that, it displaces crucial enzymes in the bacterial metabolism for the cell wall and the cell membrane that are very important. So, entrocytes comes from the dinosaurs and before they are very well adapted to this. And bacteria adapt this membrane with this what we call two complex component retro systems. So they sense the presence of the antibiotic and they change the cell envelope, activating many genes through a response regulator that is phosphorylated. In this case, after many years, we identified this system. And when there is no antibody, the system is off. The system is a transmembrane protein, a response regulator that goes to the DNA, and a protein that's phosphorylated. And when that the antibiotic is present, it's, it's this response regulator. We call the LIA FSR system, and this is the response regulator, the LIA R. So the LIA R means that this is responsible for activating the bacterial response to the antibody. I'm trying to summarize about seven years of research in this slide, okay? So this is the crystal structure that obtained from that response regulator. That has actually a site where it's phosphorylated, but mutations associated with resistance are altered the phosphorylation state that allows it to be much more active. So the, this is the site where it actually binds to the DNA, and we know where it binds. So bacteria are attacked eventually, they mutate, and this, uh, the response regulator oligomerized, this is the DNA by binding site, and basically upon oligomerization, interacts with the DNA in bacteria, different promoters, particularly ones that actually are altered the membrane, that interaction is very active, and the oligomerization makes this interaction very effective in altering with a specific uh, uh, nucleotides uh, uh, at that time. And that activates several genes that uh, protect bacteria on this. And all this downstream that are very important. When that happens, this interaction with this drug basically uh, allows the RNA polymerase to bend the DNA. And this is the response regulator in the model here. So it can be effectively transcribe these genes in the matter of seconds. So as soon as you give the antibody, these bugs are able to mutate and give that, right? So we've been working on this for a long time, and we understand the molecular. 
So the question is, in precision medicine, can we deal with these mutations to predict why the organisms have had this problem and which patients will potentially die and eventually get rid of the MIC? So that, this is uh, Dr. Tran in my laboratory. As you can see, this is a drug oxide susceptible and resistant to daptomycin, and these dots are phospholipid microdomains that are reorganized when they become resistant. And they actually not only become resistant to antibiotics, but a graduate student in my lab showed that they actually um, uh, also influence the neutrophil uh, phagocytosis. In the knockout, this response regulator, in this case, the mutant, the mutant actually, the phagocyte, human phagocyte, can actually ingest this bacteria very rapidly, and less bacteria are ingested, destroy, and not only put that, but also free bacteria from, uh, in this case, the mice uh, relatively easily. And these mutations in this system are present with their whole genome sequencing of several of these on, on, on clinical strains. So with that premise, we decided to get, develop an in vivo model or in vitro model of evolution of this, putting this cell from the patient that initially was susceptible and see how long does it take to become resistant and follow using a technology to understand what population actually select. And basically, all the populations that were selected go to that route using this three component rotation system. So if you take this and you say, okay, this is the main culprit of this, we can potentially detect mutations and predict resistance and therapy. So we did that. So this is uh, Lorena Diaz and, and, and Rafael Rios showing in various alleles of LIAR, you have four alleles, there's more than 300 patients here that are uh, organisms that basically there is a correlation potentially of the MIC or the presence of certain alleles. So you have the patient, you have the genome of the organism, can you predict which patients are going to fail or which patients are going to be successfully treated? So if this is data, the, the problem stops being a biological problem and becomes a computational mathematical problem. And that's eventually what precision medicine is going to be. Right? So Herman Contreras took a machine learning approach to do the least regression analysis to try to determine if you could identify mutations in these organisms with the clinical data that could predict the same that we have been doing for seven years. After two months of work, you know, he actually ended up identifying exactly the same genes that we biochemically identified. He could predict using an univariate analysis and continuous variables which genes will increase the MIC at different folds. He also found that certain alleles, for example, were protected. And when you put this into a model, you potentially can predict what is the MIC fault change we are actually doing the MIC, and potentially identify specific alleles that are going to be increased uh, and, 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 and alter the patient outcomes. So in HIV therapy, and Mario will agree with me here, you don't treat a patient unless you have the genomic information first. So what we want to do is to use this uh, uh, machine learning approaches to replace the MIC and understand how it does it. And currently, these organisms, when they become resistant, they become susceptible to other drugs, something that the MIC test cannot tell you either. So this is one of these organisms. This is again a killing curve. This both organisms, this is susceptible to daptomycin and resistant to daptomycin. They are both resistant to both drugs individually, but if you put these two drugs together, then you can kill them very nicely. And that's one of the combinations we now use routinely in our patients. And you can only predict that if you understand the genomic pathways, because there are some, in this case, that do not work with this combination. So, to, to finalize, 
you pull out this information and you can put this genomic information with this understanding and do all, all sorts of things including infection control. And this is an example of the lab out here. Send us this patient, uh, this isolate. She called me one day, I have an outbreak of the mesolid resistant uh, diary uh, in Miami. And say, how many patients have you? Two. Are you kidding me? So we see that in Anderson all the time, but that's never happened to here. But she was absolutely right. So she followed these patients, and to make this story short, um, she sent us the isolates. Uh, the, the laboratory was not reporting inevitably resistant. We did it in whole genome sequences that we could not identify a specific of the mechanism of resistance until we do a specific approach with the genomes to understand there was a population of bacteria that had a mutation highly associated with the mechanism of resistance. So we could tell her what to do and the way she works, you know, the, the, the outbreak was curtailed in, in, in important ways. And that also made changes in the reporting of the resolute and dactomycin resistance. So using this genomic information, you can actually do precision medicine in infection diseases. So this is, you will be pleased to hear that this is the last slide. So I, I have walked you through a concept of precision medicine in infection diseases, putting the genomic information uh, and how, how mechanistic understanding of the mechanism of resistance and the genomic information and evolution of bacteria becomes so crucial now in clinical practice. That this is the microbiology of the infectious disease of the future, where microbiologists are likely to be now informaticians rather than microbiologists as we know them. How the genomic approach could eventually replace the MICs, and we have now a funded uh, uh, study to try to do that, and then how we can merge this. In, in a way in which this happens. Using this bug as an example, it could be escalated for different bugs, but you need to learn and understand the single mechanism of resistance. And in, in, within a species, an organism could be completely different. So all these data are so much data that we need new approaches in handling the data, and the only way that that will happen is with the new tools of, of artificial intelligence. The people who did the work, I told you about uh, Bavar, who did this, Jose and Herman, Diana and Ginez in the molecular plant, and the bio, uh, bioinformatics, Lorena and Rafael Rios. And of course, uh, 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 all my collaborators, including Dr. Abel here, funding for this, which is always important. And in Houston, we uh, have a center, we have a coming meeting in January, which you are all invited. We have you know, world class people talking about the system. So if you are interested in antibiotic system from any angle, Please let me know. That's my email. You can email me anytime. And I'm really happy for your attention. Thank you very much. I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ari. It's a great way to begin the Grand Rounds University of Miami for 2018 19. Let me ask you with one question first. You said in your very begin at the very beginning how important it is the interaction of personalized medicine between the pathogen and the human and the antibiotic. But I would like to know, is there any information available on epigenetic effects that the human, that the host, exerts on the bacteria that in turn induces the resistance? And is there anything that we can do to identify how the host's uh, specific uh, make it more personalized, if you will? Absolutely. So um, I didn't mention this. But one of the big pushes that we have is try to understand how we respond, for example, to a virus compared to a bacteria. So, uh, in fact, this response is now being developed as a rapid diagnostic test. And I didn't mention the diagnostic test on this, but, um, for example, certain uh, uh, immunity regulators, particularly in the gut, are absolutely crucial to maintain certain species or microorganisms that they in the gut. Second, a second set of, 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 of genes are necessary for uh, bacteria and bloodstream infections. And the set and how they are activated influences eventually the outcome. And I didn't mention all these approaches because we are not really doing it, but 
the host response becomes so crucial that now the interactions of those genes will determine the outcome of the patient. And, and as I mentioned before, I didn't mention anything about diagnostics. Now, currently, we still take more than a day to diagnose an infectious disease. With these new tools, we hope that we have minutes to act in those in regards. Yeah, so millions of data now on this. A lot of people working on that. The, the, the foster child is clostridium difficile for obvious reasons because it's, it's, it's a point uh, of care. So there are about 25 companies now developed to try to understand which components of the microbiome are the ones that will benefit when you give a particular antibiotic. Two of them have now phase two clinical trials, which will be actually presented in IB Week in San Francisco next month. And, um, and that comes from the understanding of what happens with, a, with, a, with the microbiome when you give an antibiotic. One of these drugs, and just to put an example, is this company actually developed a beta-lactamase. And a beta-lactamase that is ingested in the gut when you give the antibiotic. So it destroys the cephalosporin in the gut and inhibits the action of the cephalosporin in the microbiome. And they could show that they can increase uh, and decrease dramatically C. difficile and VRE colonization in the gut. That's one example of innovative things that are coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.